So I want to start with a couple of points, and thanks, Tony, for the introduction, but I'm going to wear two hats as I go through this presentation. One hat is that I'm currently chair of the International Partnership Brokers Association, and I would expect that not many people in the room have heard of that association. It's a small international association that links people, the professional practice of intermediation, of working at building um, relationships, working relationships across boundaries. And I think the interesting thing from that point of view is that I would say our association believes we're rapidly moving past the age of individual capacity and we are moving into the, into the world of collective capacity as being key for success. And I think that's a really important thing that we need to start with is we've got to stop measuring the individual. We've got to start looking at, at how we measure the collective capacity of people and organisations. And, um, and that gives us a better indication of how those organisations will be able to change and address some of the, the big challenges that Valerie kicked off the day with. In my other job, my role at Microsoft, I get to work in the area of strategic partnerships. And um, that really gets me to think, the company allows me to think three to five years out, some of the, the things that are important and then how we can support or enable those through partnerships to get some work done. And so Tony mentioned some of the partnerships. I'm going to talk about one or two in particular and, uh, and we'll go on from there. The third point I want to make is that I'd like to start this session by saying my belief, and I think our company's belief, is that technology with poor pedagogy or misplaced pedagogy is of limited or no value. And it's only when you combine the best of pedagogy with the best of technology that we start to develop the capacities that people need for success. If you want to move on, Sean, I would like to start off a little bit and talk about the context. And it's the context of our work over the last few years of looking at why this area of 21st century skills and 21st century learning is important and why a company like Microsoft might invest in that area. We are a software company, we're not an education company, however I think we are a learning organisation. If you want to move on to the next slide, I'm going to pick up, I would, if I was there I'd probably do this as an, as an activity and get you to talk to people around you. Seeing I'm blind, I'm not going to do it, but you can think about how you might tackle this problem. So Sean, hopefully on the screen it should say collaborative problem solving. Yes. Is that right? It does. We're there. Yep, got it, Greg. And then it, then it might say, what might these three countries have in common? And I want you to take 30 seconds of quiet reflection, or you can talk to someone near you if you want to collaborate, and try and work out for me. What's, how would you go about working out what those three countries might have in common? Okay, seeing I'm blind, I'm going to, going to move on fairly quickly. Anyone like to share with me what they think those three countries might have in common? Or more importantly, anyone like to share about the collaborative process they, they went through? And it's interesting when I do this, usually people focus on the answer, not the process. What answers might we have? Anyone? Yeah, that's one way to do it. Some people say things like they all have flags or they they all have the letter S in their in their country names. And and really it doesn't matter, I guess, because the question I was asking was what was the process of collaborative problem solving? And that's one that I would say we're growing more familiar with. We I've heard probably a hundred times today the importance of collaboration. And I appreciate and work closely with Patrick on the work we're doing. But an understanding of what great collaboration is, I think, is tied to maybe this question about what new pedagogies are important and the new paradigms we're talking about. Interestingly, all of those countries have youth unemployment at greater than 25%. And in a world where we're facing some interesting challenges, if you'd like to click on, we could, of course, say that the reason they have high youth unemployment is because of the economic crisis. But back in 2009, when we started looking at ATC21S and the, the Innovative Teaching and Learning Research um, 
I'll talk about in a minute, it wasn't that that drove our thinking, it was more that there was a great talent mismatch, that companies like Microsoft couldn't find people with the skills and competencies we needed to be successful. And if anything, that problem's got worse. We're a company of about 40,000 people in the US, and we currently have 6,000 open positions that we can't fill. And of those 6,000, 3,600 are engineers and researchers, the most senior and high paid people in the, in the company, and the rate of increase in that number is 36% year over year, meaning that we ca just can't find people to employ to do the type of innovative problem solving, collaboration, teamwork, analytics and research based activities that we need. And so you might say that's just Microsoft, but I can go around the world to any country nearly and find high youth unemployment along with um, this talent mismatch, meaning that we have an interesting challenge with youth who are going through school and many going through university or college and then finding it extremely difficult for them to take a job. If you want to click on to the next slide, this is the, the graph as I hopefully everyone in the room has seen it. And I just want to make one point about this graph that I stole from OECD. And that is that it talks about the shift in skills up, and, up until 2002. The thing that I think a lot of people may not notice is that if you look at the trajectory of those, those lines on the graph and you extrapolate out 10 years, you can imagine the gap that's happening between those areas. And we're seeing that, if you want to click on for me, Sean, as highlighted in the McKinsey, recent McKinsey report about the changes in the labour market, I think one of the big challenges that we face as a company and, and that I think the world faces is the shift in the labour market. In fact, in the US, they recently reported that the economy here has reached peak jobs, meaning that because of robots and because of productivity gains, the size of the job pool will never grow again, that it will only shrink, meaning that there will be people that won't be able to find a job, perhaps in their lifetime. And that's a real challenge. I would like to move on now, and, and if you click on Sean, onto the Innovative Teaching and Learning Research, I want to talk about this research project that we kicked off about three years ago, because we were trying to answer that question. What are the teaching practices? What are the conditions? What are the factors that would influence young people leaving school with what people were calling 21st century skills? Now, I'm not a big, big uh, favourite of that term, 21st century skills. I'd rather call it deep learning competencies. But I will try and use the term because it's, uh, well, I might, not, I might shift to, um, to deep learning competencies instead, because I think that's probably more relevant. I'm going to give you a, a thin slice of the research because it's quite deep, and if people want to, I can direct you to the full research study and the reports that come out of it. If you want to click on, Sean. We're on the key question slide. The ITL research was built to look at three key questions. One was, what are the education system factors that might influence the ability of young people to develop these skills? What are the school leadership and culture factors and what are the innovative teaching practices? And really we wanted to look at these domains because we felt that there was a, a key relationship between them. Looking at just one was a limited view. If you skip on again, Sean, we looked at this term innovative teaching practices and working with the research partner who kicked this off, and this was a partnership I might add that involved researchers from around the globe and many education systems, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those. What we found was that, um, from the research and the, and the literature, was that these three areas were, had the strongest relationship with learning outcomes. Student-centered pedagogies, you can see there what we're talking about, extending learning and ICT integration. We're talking about high-level usage of technology, not low-level, and we'll, I'll dig in and, and explain that a little bit. If you move on, Sean, this research has been undertaken in, in eight countries at depth and about 40 countries using a lighter version of the tools. Um, interestingly, we didn't just go for the regular cast of characters. You'll see there's some interesting countries in here like Senegal, like uh, Brunei, etc. So we had small and large developed and developing uh, north, south, east and west. And if we click on to the next slide, Really what we were looking at was how does teaching shape the development of these 21st century skills, or more, more likely the key problem that we're discussing today, 
how does teaching shape 21st century learning? Do you want to click on again? Very quickly, the, the scatter graph you can see there um, is, a, is a top level of one of the key findings from the research was that one of the key things that the research found was that A, that there was little variance in the level of innovative teaching practice across those countries. So it wasn't a matter of develop versus developing or east versus west or north versus south. It was fairly common. It did, the, the way that technology was applied did impact it, but the, the factor with the highest correlation or the, the one that caused the highest variation of students' ability to develop these skills was learning activity design. And I think, again, we've, we've heard that today earlier on, but it's just interesting to point out. The other thing that came out of it was that while there are great examples there, they're very um, unevenly spread and the great examples are rare. If we move on again, Sean. So we asked the question, why not? Why were those things barriers or what were the barriers to those things from a classroom perspective? And so I'm going to pull it apart, the three factors there, and have a look at them. ICT integration, uh, extending learning, and student-centered pedagogies. So if we click on the next, the technology one is interesting. And I think, again, this is reinforcing comments that have come up earlier today. But how students yet use technology is important. And the most of the use of technology in schools is very basic use of, on the consumption side of, of getting students to do routine skills, of getting them to find information on the internet and not do anything with it. And as we went on and looked at the higher levels of use of technology, they got fewer and fewer and fewer. So obviously one of the challenges we face is a more discernment around what technology use or what technology integration means and the way it's being applied to learning activities that promote and develop higher order skills. If we click on, Sean, some of the school factors that, that came into play was that the culture of the school was critical and really what we wanted to do was look on these key areas of what support for teaching and learning was in the school that made a difference. If I can click on again, one of the things we found, and as I said, I'm just taking a shave of the research, but one of the key things, and one of the things that was most strongly associated with innovative teaching practices was a school climate that promoted and supported collaboration about teaching and learning. And you can see that it makes a huge difference that when teachers are collaborating, but not just collaborating, but they're collaborating about the learning activities and teaching practices that they're using. Again, and I, I think that supports other research, but it's an interesting factor, and that school climate was one of the things that are important. If we skip on to the, the system factors, in other words, what is it at the system level that, uh, that influences these innovative teaching and learning practices in the classroom? This was quite interesting. One of the things that came back consistently was, and I think this is something that hasn't been raised a whole lot today, is the sometimes confused state of policy, sometimes uh, counter view state of policy, but definitely not clean and focused policy aligned to a clear vision of learning. And I think that's one of the things that may need to be considered when we start to talk about the new paradigm is what is the, the policy practice loop and how does practice influence policy and how does policy influence practice? If you, uh, if you go to the professional development slide, key thing here is professional development works when it focuses on teachers conducting and undertaking collaborative research and doing things together. I'm going to skip on to the policy implications that one of the things that we think is important here is, as I mentioned, this, this harmonisation of policy and practice, and we think that's critical. So while we are working with governments around the world, we also want to provide tools to schools. Sean, if you want to click on to the PLSR slide, we've provided out of this research a set of um, methodologies that schools can undertake their own um, research into the teaching and learning environment, the innovative teaching and learning environment that's in their school. What this research is meant to do is not be definitive, but more start to open up the types of questions and discussions that are needed in the school to move the agenda along. If I want to move on a little bit, I'm going to skip a couple of slides and I'm going to ask Sean to talk 
uh, for a couple of minutes about the 21st century learning design work we've been doing, seeing that's one of the key topics. Sean, over to you. Thanks, Greg. Well, I'll be quick because I know we're running out of time and you're doing a great job. The, um, what we wanted to do with this research was to make it so that we could have a practical application for teachers in the classroom. <clears throat> We've got a working committee now which has a senior representative from every state and territory in Australia. Uh, and we're building this out to an Australian local yeah. version that's mapped to the national mm -hmm. curriculum, etc. So to go quickly, here's kind of what it looks like in a very simplistic top-line overview. And we need to dig into this deeper to, to, to make real sense of it. But essentially, it's a set of really simple decision trees. They give the school a common language for what the 21st century skills are, or contemporary skills, or whatever we want to call them. Uh, and then some, some ways of looking at whether or not learning activities actually set up conditions for the kids to demonstrate or develop those capabilities. Each of these comes then with a set of what it is, it is, looks like this, it's not this. Uh, anchor papers, so you can look at it and say, oh, well, there's an example of a, of a one or a two, to try and help people to level set. But what we've found is that this, this simple process, we've used it in countries all around the world, is something that makes a massive difference very quickly. So this was we did in a large province in Russia where we got a whole gr group of students and we measured there in year one how are we actually creating learning activities that create these conditions and then tested it again a year later after only giving them that simple tool. So it had a huge impact. It's, it's got a huge impact in what we can do nationally here uh, and so we're excited to be working with every state and territory and it's something that you're, is available to you now um, and it's, as, it's using the same language as in, in our national documents very quickly, and sorry for just spewing it out so fast. But back to you, Greg. OK, three points I'll finish with. If you've got the photo of what students say, I think one of the critical things that we've enjoyed out of this is, is hearing what students think about the change in learning. And I think I want to make the point that student voice is, is critical in this whole process. I'm not going to read the quote, but it's lovely that she says that people are making us think and are challenging us with different types of projects than in the past. The next slide is, hopefully, is that my bridge slide? Next steps. Sean? Next steps. Next steps. I want to, I, uh, just before I jump to the next steps, I did have a quote here that I was just going to share with you. I don't think I got in that final one, but it's one from a, the Professor of Management Organisation, University of Michigan. He says, when you commit to a vision of something that's never been done before, there's no way of knowing how to get there. You have to simply build the bridge as you walk on it. And I would say one of the things is for those people who want a definitive map of how they're going to get to the future, they're probably not going to find it. So some of the big questions that we're thinking about that we will work towards answering might be, what is student success for the future? And I think that's a really, really hard question for us to think about, but it's an important one. And I think we need to separate what is school success from life success or student success. And how do we measure it? One of the new pedagogies enabled through ICTs, and I mean this in the sense of the technology is allowing things that we couldn't do before, and that's happening in isolated pockets, not spread evenly across the teaching population. What are those new pedagogies? How do we spread them more evenly? And how can we bring together new pedagogies, ICT and change knowledge to have impact at scale? And I will leave you with that. Thank you very much, Tony, for the time.